Berea's History by Jairus Banaji. This is Chapter 8. Aristocracies, Peasantries, and the Framing of the Early Middle Ages. 8.1 Introduction In this chapter, I would like to develop a general contrast between the West and the East Mediterranean, Near East, which has its roots in the classical world, especially the period known as Late Antiquity. By, say, 600, the West was defined by a tradition of tied labor inherited from the late Roman world and shaped both by the strength of slavery in the post-Roman tradition and by the legacy of the colonnade. By contrast, in the East, much of the rural labor force is best described as a landless peasantry that survived on short-term leases or by labor tenancy on the large estates where these existed. The eastern provinces of the Roman Empire were characterized by a disciplined aristocracy, a thriving monetary economy, and densely populated countrysides. A new aristocracy emerged in the late 5th century, and one of its most striking features was its ability to build substantial states and ensnare that these properties remained intact over generations. Thus, the Apian estates in Egypt are attested from the, f from the 430s down to the 620s, when the last known member of the family, Flavius Apian III, was killed by the Persians. Both Peter Sarus and I have described the main features of a state organization characteristic of this late antique aristocracy. The direct management of substantial estates which grouped their works into settlements that were both structurally and topographically sharply demarcated from the villages. It is these work workers whom I started by defining as a landless pe peasantry. The usual term for them was Georgoi, but it is, or Gorgoi, Georgoi, but it is, but it is important to realize that in their case, the term referred not to a small holding peasantry, but to rural households of whom the majority were clearly dependent on the estate for employment. In the more densely settled eastern provinces, landless was endemic, or landlessness was endemic, and large estates were major employers of such labor. But the East Mediterranean was also characterized by a diversified labor market, with considerable fluidity in the forms of employment and types of contrasts that wage earners settled for. Sharecropping was widespread and sustained the expansion of the wine industry, but so was casual labor and a host of more skilled employments trades, some regulated to impede collusive wage agreements or wage inflation. Now, some of these features of the late antique East Mediterranean would have been true of the West as well. For example, Procopius tells us that the majority of Rome's population in the 530s consisted of artisans and casual laborers. Also, there was no dramatic de-escalation of monetary economy in the West, but rather a gradual decline. The crucial difference, of course, was that by the 6th century, the late Roman aristocracies no longer ruled the state and the various kingdoms that replaced the empire. Since the imperial system had ceased to exist and their survival depended on adjustments with system or with the barbarian rulers in the regions where they regrouped. In other words, when the Western Empire fell apart in the 5th century and the former Roman, Roman territories were taken over by the Franks, Burgundians, and Goths, the Western aristocracy ceased to exist as a unified imperial class, surviving now only as fragmented regional groupings, of which the most substantial by the 6th century were those in Rome, southern Italy in the south of France. In Chris Wickham's recent magnum opus, the general weakening and impoverishment of the aristocracy that was bound up with the fragmentation of the late empire is a major theme, rightly so, and a decisive part of the transition to the early Middle Ages. By the end of the 6th century, the late Roman aristocracy had effectively ceased to exist in the West. Now, Wickham himself identifies this process that is, the crisis of the Western aristocracy, with a certain emancipation of the peasantry 
in the sense that the huge fiscal machinery of the late Roman state had disintegrated so that peasants were less intensively taxed or not taxed at all. And the rural population faced a much less powerful group of landowners. In other words, the post-Roman West saw a recovery of control by peasants, an advance that was finally only reversed with the reassertion of aristocratic dominance that followed later and unevenly between the 7th and the 10th century. As he argued in an earlier work, the peasantry was the chief social group that benefited from the fall of the Roman state and a not insignificant, insi and a not insignificant class of peasant owners had survived the wars and patronage agreements of the 5th century. Of the two theses just delineated, that of a crisis of the, of the imperial aristocracy in the West and of a reassertion of peasant control during much of the early Middle Ages, the former can scarcely be contested. The late Roman aristocracy disappeared unevenly but, in the end, with finality. No historian has ever argued the opposite, despite the obsession with continuity peculiar to some historians in France. The second thesis, however, is much less obvious and substantially at odds with my own reading of the evidence. Wickham construes the advance of the peasantry in the earliest Middle Ages as an expansion of the peasant mode of production, which came to be juxtaposed with a feudal mode in a vast patchwork of micro-regions that reflected the extreme economic fragmentation of the post-Roman West. The main evidence for this view is the sharp differences in the scale and sophistication of exchange networks reflected in the ceramic evidence, at least as archaeologists currently construe this. This thesis, which I shall call the micro-regionality of modes of production, has its own share of problems, of course. Here, modes of production become descriptive of a set of local economic structures but my main interest at this stage is in Wickham's use of the written evidence. Wickham believes that the late Roman and the post-Roman West were both characterized by a feudal mode of production. This is, one, because he defines the feudal mode in a general way as the exploitative relationship between tenant and landlord, any tenant and any landlord, a definition that is presumably consciously ahistorical, and two, because he thinks that when the Romans abandoned the slave mode, they went straight over to rent paying tenants, and this long before the advent of the late empire. These are substantial conceptual and historical claims, and I shall come back to them later. To begin with, however, I would like to try and use Wickham's book as a springboard for some reflections of my own about the West, and to start by mapping out a set of contrasts between aristocracies in the late antique world. I shall then propose a hypothesis about the nature of the 7th century and devote the remaining part of the discussion of the West to a critique of Wickham's model of the transition from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages. Thus, the first part of the paper about the West deals with the three separate sets of issues just described, which, though distinct, are clearly interrelated. The third of these levels involves a much closer consideration of the whole issue of the deployment of labor. Wickham's model of the transition is premised on general categories that are unreconstructed or lack any further analysis. One upshot of this is that there is no serious engagement with documentary sources and no analysis of the actual vocabulary used in these sources of crucial terms like mancipium, mansis, Colonica, and so on. When Ganshoff wrote in the 1950s and 60s, his confusing description of the Merovingian villa as a manor attracted no comment, because the whole issue of the origins of the bipartite estate still awaited the decisive clarification that it received in the work of Adrian Verholst. Verholst, of course, argued convincingly in my view the classic manorial regime was a purely medieval creation, discontinuous with the Roman traditions of Gaul and an expression of the dynamism implicit in the Merovingian economy. One of the theses I would like to propose in this chapter is that much of that dynamism was bound up with the kind of aristocracy that the Merovingians succeeded in establishing, unique for the post-Roman West. 
To see this, it may be useful to discuss the first of my topics, the contrasting nature and histories of aristocracies. In terms of the three distinct sets of issues that seem to be implicit in it, namely, first, of the kinds of aristocracies that dominate the main part of late antiquity, before the decisive evolution of the 7th century, we might call this the problem of morphology, Second, of the fate or fortunes of the aristocracy and the huge upheavals that dominate the history of the empire in the 5th and 6th centuries, when the Roman imperial state disintegrated bit by bit and eventually ceased to exist except as a pervasive cultural legacy. And third, of the dramatically different ways in which Franks and Visigoths, the nobilities in particular, reacted to rule by a hereditary monarchy an issue which surprisingly has received little attention. 8.2 Aristocracies To begin with, the morphological problem. Take the Western Empire in the 4th, 5th, and early 6th centuries. Egypt or the East Mediterranean, more generally between the later 5th and early 7th centuries. And Sasanian Iran. Iran under the Sas the Sassanids was ruled by powerful regional barons who were firmly wedded to the Sasanian dynasty, but also largely in control of royal succession. Among late antique aristocracies, they were the least well integrated into something we might call a state. Their unswerving commitment to dynastic rule is a striking feature and suggests that this was the key factor to of cohesion in a class defined otherwise by strongly centrifugal tendencies. When Hormozdan, the powerful aristocrat who dominated southwestern Iran at the time of the Arab conquest, was asked by Umar, from which territory are you? He replied, I am a Mirajani. Regional identities were clearly quite strong, even and perhaps precisely at these levels of Sasanian society. At the opposite end of the spectrum to them is the early Byzantine East Mediterranean aristocracy that emerges with some vividness in the Egyptian papyri of the late, later 5th, 6th, and early 7th centuries. This aristocracy was typically a dienst de tel, its roots firmly embedded in service to the late Roman state a concept for which there is no obvious Sasanian counterpart. Their trajectory runs from the main part of the 5th century to the early 7th, when they were destroyed or dispersed in the Sasanian and Arab invasions that followed in quick succession in the years 610 to 40. The little we know about the origins of this group suggests that it was the creature of a coherent, culturally sophisticated, and economically affluent state the East Roman Empire, which reached the pinnacle of its strength under Justinian in the 6th century. Finally, the Western aristocracy was an intensely traditionalist group or ensemble of groups more loosely integrated into the imperial state, dominating it as much as it served it, and as subversive of imperial unity as the Iranian Bozorgin were of rulers they disliked. An important aspect of this domination was the fact that the leading senatorial families, or more correctly, clans, established a significant measure of control over the fiscal system through the offices they monopolized. There is a tradition of late Roman historiography that argues that the Italian aristocracy, more than any other, more than any other sabotaged the coherence of its own state and bears a major share of the blame for the downfall of the empire in the West. Whatever one thinks of this, the fact is that Western aristocracies long outlived the imperial government, seeking their own accommodation with barbarian rulers. If the disintegration of the Western Empire sounded the death knell of an integrated imperial aristocracy of the kind that had emerged under Constantine, transforming the Senate into a purely Italian body and choking off the sources of renewal of a living senatorial tradition, it also reflected the dispersive tendencies of aristocratic networks that had never been more than loosely integrated into a shifting imperial center. The rapid consolidation of the Western upper classes in the 4th century was followed by their gradual but sustained erosion in the 5th and 6th, as the unified state disintegrated under the pressure of barbarian migrations, settlement, and conquest. <clears throat> 
This crisis was most obvious in 6th century Italy, but reflected, of course, throughout the Western provinces to unequaled degrees. For the moment, the point I wish to make is that late antique aristocracies show major differences in the nature of their integration into the state, and that these differences are in some sense more fundamental than the civilian military divide that Wickham concentrates on in discussing the transformation of the aristocracy. A quintessential late Roman aristocracy had more or less disappeared by the turn of the 6th century, but its surviving networks followed very different paths into limbo. The Italian aristocracy was decimated by the Gothic Wars and the violence of the Lombard invasion that followed. Unlike the Franks and the Burgundians, the Lombards did not seek the, the collaboration of the Roman aristocracy. Thus, large estates survived, but the aristocracy was eliminated or fled. By contrast, the Merovingian kingdoms, and especially that of Neustria, saw the evolution of an ethnically integrated aristocracy based on a fusion of the surviving Roman families and their Frankish counterparts. Bertram, Bishop of Le Mans from 586 to 616, is a superb example of the new kind of aristocracy that would dominate the political history of the 7th century. More powerfully and obviously in Francia, or Francia, Francia than elsewhere in the West. My own feeling is that if we want a zone of rupture between late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, it must lie here in the formation of the precocious nobilities that dominated the Frankish Telreich already by the first quarter of the 7th century. They were the first purely medieval nobilities of Europe, a peculiarly Merovingian achievement, thanks largely to the conscious policy of Chilperic and his son Clothar II, Neustrian rulers, in seeking the active support of regional elites throughout Francia, in Austra Austrasia, Burgundy, and Aquitaine, Aqu Aqu Aquitaine, and integrating them into a pan Merovingian Frankish ruling class. This evolution is important for the agrarian history of the West because it was in Francia that a new kind of enterprise and organization of labor first emerged. The continuity with Rome lay in the survival of large enterprises. The rupture and the rapid evolution of powerful new aristocracies by the late 6th century, unlike any previous ruling class that had dominated the West. In Spain, too, the old aristocracy passed rapidly into limbo. A surviving Roman aristocracy is much harder to track than it is in Gaul. But the Visigothic aristocracy itself was deeply divided and permanently embroiled in conflict with the crown. The repeated assassination of Visigothic rulers is striking testimony to this. The chronicler Fredegar, or his 7th century source, called it the Morbum Gothorum, the Visigothic addiction for dethroning their kings. Here, the, the Merovingian pattern of a strong dynasty and stable aristocratic elites could not have been more radically reversed. This raises a final issue with or about aristocracies. I would like to suggest that the dynastic principle favored the interests of the aristocracy. The weaker the monarchy, the less held together it was by the common bond of a ruling family, the sharper the conflicts within the aristocracy. Unregulated, unregulated succession to the throne reflected lack of cohesion among aristocrats and repeated attempts at usurpation, suggesting unmanageable levels of conflict and considerable fragmentation. This, as I just said, is best exemplified in Spain, where royal succession was characterized by chronic and often violent instability, and there was deep factionalism within the aristocracy. A succession of rulers were either deposed or overthrown. Leo Vigild was the only ruler to be followed on the throne by his son and grandson, and he characteristically had the reputation of having ex executed or exiled much of the aristocracy. The contrast with his late 6th century Frankish counterparts could scarcely be greater. Chilperic and his son had pursued a far-sighted policy of seeking the support of elites in Austrasia, Burgundy, and Aqu Aquitaine and the net result was the rapid evolution of powerful aristocracies in the crucial decades around the later 6th and early 7th century.
In Francia, where the dominance of the Merovingians was never actually contested, the dynastic principle worked in a complex form that necessitated the division and redivision of territories to preserve some balance between the competing Merovingian claimants. Whereas Spain saw an unstable monarchy pitted against a fra fractious and fragmented aristocracy, in Francia, conflict had tended to run between different members or branches of the ruling dynasty, and the division of territory between them almost certainly helped to reduce the level of conflict within the aristocracy. One reason may have been that it allowed for strong regional control, a principle formally embodied in the famous Edict of 614 in which Clother explicitly restricted the holding of offices to families within the region. This, as Sprandl emphasized repeatedly, was not equivalent to some form of Frankish regionalism. On the contrary, what Chilperic and Clother managed to create was a Reichsaristocracy with firm local roots. Of the three main Germanic kingdoms that emerged from the ruins of the West Empire, the Regnum Francorum was far and away the most stable, whereas the muted struggle between the Visigothic nobility and the crown that runs through much of the history of Spain in the 7th century culminates, of course, in the Arab conquest of the peninsula. The final episode in the internal factionalism of the Visigothic aristocracy was also a fatal one. Tradition claims that the sons of the deceased King Witiza actively conspired against Roderick, the last Visigothic king, to ensure his defeat in the decisive battle that ended his reign in the kingdom. These divisions were so obvious to contemporaries that the Chronicle of 754 links them directly to the success of the Arabs in overthrowing the Visigothic kingdom. Eight point three, the agrarian watershed of the seventh century. My hypothesis about the seventh century is that it forms an agrar agrarian watershed in the history of the West. The seventh century in the West was crucial in two ways. First, it saw first it saw a reassertion of aristocratic control, and second, it involved, I believe, the beginnings of a new agrarian expansion. These features would, of course, be linked if a strong case can be made for the view that the aristoc aristocracy financed much of that expansion. I do not propose to do that here, but it may be worth indicating briefly some clear signs that such a connection existed. One of the most striking features of the Merovingian charters is the sheer frequency of references to the purchase of land that appears in them. Here is a typical example from the will of Hadoined Bishop of Le Mans, dated 643. Among numerous donations listed in the will, Hadoin says he donates to the Church of St. Victor of Le Mans, the estate villa called Asaruco, which I purchased for money, together with the houses, mancipia, vineyards, forests, meadows, and pastures. There are dozens of references of this kind in the private charters the, of the Merovingian period, and the least this tells us is that the new aristocracy of the 7th century made substantial investments in the acquisition of land, usually whole estates. They did the same in the great movement of land clearance that began in the 7th century. The vast mouvement de défrichement that Verhulst described as a key feature of the evolution from the Merovingian estate to the Carolingian manor, and the same again in the construction of water mills, as Dietrich Lorman has pointed out in an important paper on Neustria. Here, the crucial point is that the elements of a new organization of labor began to be laid out as landowners encouraged the expansion of peasant tenures as part of their reclamation of arable. This process must have thrown up hundreds of new settlements, and I suggest that one term for these settlements was colonica. If the term colonica could refer both to the new settlements located on the fringes, boundaries, or appendages of estates, suggesting an origin in the colonization of the wasteland, and to the individual tenures that made up these settlements, this would explain why the word shows a mystifying semantic ambiguity 
fluctuating be between usages that manifestly refer to entire settlements, as in Bertram's will, where Marguerite Wiedemann explains the term as Os Basid Lung im Barak Einer Villa, and other uses where Colonica is undoubtedly a designation for farms, as when Abel refers to various freed people as of his holding Colonicae in Beneficio, this in province in the early 8th century. One imagines that these new settlements were the first proper signs of the emergence of re or re-emergence of a peasantry in Europe, and that the accolades who appear with increasing frequency from the later 7th century, they are there already in Hadoin's will of 643, were essentially free peasants attracted to estates as part of their divine or as part of their drive to expand cultivation. The colonization of the wasteland was, was the seventh century's major contribution to the history of the countryside in this part of Europe. By contrast, another key term, Manzis, which is almost invariably explained in the same way <clears throat> or referred to the same context. In other words, the creation of, pe of peasant tenures may well have had a more complex origin, the proper starting point for which must be our notions of, of Merovingian estate organization. New estates for a new aristocracy? The answer, as almost always in history, is yes and no. In a typically fascinating aside, Mark Bloch once suggested that the best historical analogy for the early medieval estate in, is the Latin American hacienda. What Bloch himself meant by this was that the regime of the hacienda was never so dense that it completely excluded the presence of small independent landowners. The more general point of the analogy, I take it, is that early medieval estates, or let us say the typical Merovingian estate, exploited a landless workforce comparable in this respect to the Ghanaians in Mexico. This emphasizes continuity with the late Roman world. If, unlike Wickham, and the ancient historians he follows, we see the late Roman estate as an enterprise still based on direct management and not pulverized into semi-autonomous farms or holdings. And again, that continuity is one of, one, one of form rather than substance in the sense that the disappearance of the Roman aristocracy and the rise of new medieval nobilities signified a major rupture in the social and economic history of the West. Thus, the best context to discuss the meaning of the term mansus surely has to be the way we visualize the transition from late Roman to purely medieval forms of organization in terms of the way landowners structured the management and use of labor and of the kinds of workforces they deployed. Again, the Merovingian charters are our best clue to the nature of the rural labor force in the 6th and 7th centuries. If the will of Remigius dated circa 533 is any indication, slavery was still widespread in Gaul in the early 6th century. In fact, Remigius's farms were based on a mixed labor force of servi and colonae, and the colonae clearly were tied laborers inherited from the late empire, still called by that name and referring in the will itself to half free or unfree rural laborers distinct from slaves. For example, they could be bequeathed with the land, transferred between owners, manumitted, and their families could likewise be bequeathed. One of them had even owned service, and at least one of Remigius's colonae was still called Arigenarius. Moreover, Remigius's servi also had families. Again, in 538, and roughly contemporary with Remigius's will, a Gallic or Gaelic church council legislates that no person bound by the conditio of a service or colonist should be admitted to ecclesiastical office. The precise expression used is nullus servilibus, oh fuck, nullus servilibus colonarisque conditionibus obligatus. At any rate, neither slaves nor coloni disappeared with the disintegration of the Western Empire. Both were present in large numbers and merged indiscriminately into the labor force.
The integration of these diverse categories of labor into an increasingly indiscriminate labor force also found a precise expression in the way Latin terminology evolved. The strict Roman legal term for a slave, mancipium, became the standard generic description for a labor force now characterized by looser forms of bondage, where the precise legal condition of the workers mattered less and less. For example, Remigius's will is decisive proof that many families were of mixed legal status. That is, members of the same family could be of different legal conditiones. These distinctions were not rigid, therefore. Mancipia included both slaves and freed people, but post-classical slaves and freed people still subject to domination, and the expression mancipia quae culinaria appellanter from the will of Aridius, dated 573 or 591, shows the former colonae, tied laborers, were included as well. Now the Merovingian charters refer standardly to domus and mancipia among the appurtenances of the estate, informalized such as cum domibus, mancipis, agris, etc. In the will of Bishop Bertram, the most substantial document of its kind from the 7th century, which has a wonderful edition and commentary by Wiedemann, ipsum villum cum Domibus, mancipus, and so on, is about the most common expression used. I may be wrong, but it is my strong impression that in the 7th century charters, domus are never mentioned without mancipia, which suggests that they were the dwellings of the labor force. Betram had some 74 estates, and they were, and they were almost all equipped in this way, together with land, of course, and land of various descriptions such as vineyards, arable and pasture, as well as more substantial constructions called edificia. There's also repeated reference to forest land. Occasionally, Bertram refers to colonicae, which these were on the boundaries, or sorry, but these were on the boundaries of his estates, and as Wiedemann suggests, most probably the cutting edge of an expanding regime of arable. At one point, Bertram refers to buying a villa, or a portion of one, the estate of Brassai, where he constructed homes and settled labor. There's a fascinating passage in Gregory of Tours which shows that the drive to expand cultivation in this way was equally true of the first generation of the new Merovingian aristocracy. For Gregory describes a certain Croton, a man of great virtue and piety, almost certainly a Frank, deceased by 582, often creating estates from scratch laying out vineyards, building homes, and clearing the land. About a century later, Vigilius, Bishop of Auxerre, donated Vinland, Vineland to his church. <clears throat> Cum mancipis quos ibidem stabilivi. The remarkable feature of the will of Vigilius, dated circa 680, is the repeated reference to mansi and servi. Medievalists generally agree that the term mansus is largely an innovation of the 7th century, but the precise agrarian function they tend to assign to it is a kind of peasant tenure, the role it has within the economic framework of the bilateral estate. But bilateral estates were not a feature of the 7th century. They were a Carolingian innovation, and we have to explain the Merovingian mansus differently. One striking clue to its meaning is that while mansi appear repeatedly in the will just mentioned, there's no reference to domus. As tits diode dio di, 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 oh, dia, dia aid suggested in an important paper, mansis est utilisé ici à la place de domus. In other words, the Merovingian mansi were not primarily peasant tenures, but allotments created for the Mancipia, Servi in Vigilius's testament. Unlike the peasant tenures of a later period, notably the Central Middle Ages, these allotments were still an integral part of the Merovingian Gutzwurtschaft. 
and their occupants a class of workers, both slaves and freed people, endowed with service holdings rather than self-sufficient farms. The most substantial argument along these lines is perhaps paradoxically Ulrich Weidinger's excellent analysis of the 9th century inventory material from Fulda. The Gutterversichtnis Guter whose drafters used vocabulary rather differently from the people who drove up the purely economic documents. Weidinger shows at length that, that the Mansai, which figure in the Fulda inventories, did not include the surroundings, surrounding fields and meadows. They were Klein, Hostelinibitabri, <laughs> that functioned as reserves of labor for a still largely integrated estate. The Gutswirtschaft system and their holders were a class of farm workers, still servile, of course, who were subject to almost unlimited exploitation. Weidinger also argues that estate owners would have carved out these plots with a view to preserving or creating some symmetry, either square or rectangular, in their home farms, which is why the Mansai tended to fluctuate in size. In this sense, and in all these respects, then the Mansai were radically different from the peasant farms known as Hubei. Um, I lost my spot. Which, of course, did include fields, meadows, and the like, and were of a size consciously calculated to yield the normative subsistence of a peasant family hence more standardized. These are two points I would like to draw attention to in this analysis. First, Weidinger offers a model, at least implicitly, of the gradual dissolution of the post-Roman Gutzwurt shaft. If the carving out of service holdings for allotment to the various groups of Mancipia can, and it surely can, be construed as a mechanism that eroded the integrity of the classic late Roman estate. A passage in the Vitus Sanctorum Patrum Emeritium, a piece of Spanish hagiography written possibly in the 630s, suggests that it was standard practice to make such allotments when slaves were freed. When the bishop Massena wrote out documents of manumission for the slaves who had given him faithful service, he, in confirmation of their liberty, gave them a little sum of money and even little parcels of land. Um, I lost my spot again. In Italy, such allotments were probably called Casse or Casales, Casalia. And in the Lombard part of Italy, the Masseri were initially overwhelmingly of servile origin. They were servi, masseri, and only slightly more exalted than the completely landless slaves. My second comment is that Weidinger's distinction between Mansus and Huba chimes remarkably well with the kind of model Ross Faith has developed for the Anglo-Saxon inland, and her sharp distinction between worker tenants and the self-sufficient small peasantry that came to form the true backbone of serfdom in the great feudal reaction of a later period. The inland, Faith writes, was an area likely to have been crowded with the dwellings of the workers and tenants who lived there, which reflects a very different topography of power from the bilateral estate. In fact, it is the Anglo-Saxon material that shows us how finely graded the early medieval labor force could be, yet bound together by their common condition of landlessness and servility, and Faith's description of the inland workforce as a mixed servile labor force strikes me as the best characterization we have of the rural labor force in the centuries between the fall of the Western Empire and the imposition of serfdom and the great feudal transformation in the decades around 1000. Faith refers to the slave and ex-slave farm servants with their cottages huddled on the inland round the Curia, which may well be how we, could, how we should imagine the Merovingian labor force the Mancipia in con contrast to the Acolae, that is, as farm workers in a class distinct from the peasantry. Eight point four Critique of Wickham.
To turn now to framing the early Middle Ages, Wickham's image of the transition is completely different in this respect. It is an image dominated by a simple dialectic, the disintegration of something he calls the slave mode of production, and its more or less direct replacement by tenancy. This is supposed to have happened well before 400, in particular in the second and third centuries, and can, Wickham argues, be construed as an economic shift from the slave mode to the feudal mode. Thus, the feudal mode of production is seen as expanding in a gradual piecemeal fashion as tenancy expands, and it now covers a vast stretch of history from the second or third century to presumably the later Middle Ages, a period of well over 1,000 years, a view that should baffle Marxists at least. This model, simple as it is, has several obvious and even passive implications for the way we construct the agrarian history of these periods. In the first place, it implies that Roman landowners gave up direct management when they abandoned the slave mode. Secondly, it denies, ignores, or hugely underestimates the persistence of slavery in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. Thirdly, it construes the colonatus of the late empire simply as a system of rent-paying tenancies with minimal implications for the actual subordination and control of labor. Finally, and most substantially, Wickham sees the tenancy of these historical periods as a type of self-management in which peasants controlled the land and their own work process, or controlled their own holding and could keep its fruits after rents were paid. In other words, there was, as he says, limited landowner control over production, indeed limited interest in it, at least till the emergence of manorialism in the Carolingian period. I would like to suggest that Wickham's handling of both slavery and the colony are among the weakest parts of his excellent book. The sheer scale of manumissions that followed in the 7th century, e.g. Spain and England, shows how widespread slavery was still in late antiquity. Legal sources, both late Roman and barbarian, provide one indication of this. Wickham's wholesale disregard of the legal evidence is not credible and has rightly been characterized by Andrea Giardina as a sort of reductionism. There are numerous con constitutions in the Theo Theodosian Code which either deal with or refer to slavery both rural and urban, though this clearly is not the place to rehearse the details. The standard legal term for a slave was mancipium, the neuter signifying conscious reification. In CTH 2.25.1, possibly 325, Constantine stipulated that the children of slaves employed on imperial estates in Sardinia should not be separated from their parents when, these, when those estates were handed over to private individuals or divided in some way. In CTH 9.42.7, 369, a detailed inventory was prescribed for estates confiscated from private landowners convicted of criminal offenses. The plena descriptio would have to indicate how many slaves, either urban or rural, are contained on the seized estate, how many cottagers and colonai there are, how many oxen are employed in working the land, etc. It is hard to see why the potential evidence of constitutions like these should be discounted on the general prejudice that law has a normative function. In any case, numerous sources refer to rural slaves. The Greek life of the younger Melania refers to the slaves on her suburban estates near Rome, while the author of the Lossiac History, who knew Melania, reports that she manumitted 8,000 of them. When Alaric besieged Rome in 408-9, many slaves, especially those of barbarian origin, deserted to join him. Augustine's polemic against the Donatists is full of references to recalcitrant slaves, and in the 5th century, one chronicle tells us that nearly all the slaves of the Gaelic provinces conspired 
in the Bacotic movement. As E.A. Thompson remarked, our sources seem to suggest that these revolts were due primarily to the agricultural slaves, or at any rate that slaves played a prominent part in them. In short, the balance of evidence supports Finley's conclusion that slavery survived on a considerable, quantita considerable quantitative scale. But this was equally, equally true of the 6th and 7th centuries. According to Tom Brown, slaves were widely used in cultivating the patrimony of the Roman Church. Indeed, in Italy, it was not till the 9th century that slavery began to fade away. In Spain, the Visigothic legislation is full of references to slavery. Thompson's, Thompson tells us, no subject interested the legislators of the 6th and 7th centuries more than the recovery of escaped slaves. It is not surprising then that Werner Rosener should claim, as he has done in a recent paper, slavery was still widespread in the transition from late antiquity to the Middle Ages, and the Germanic kingdoms of the early Middle Ages are scarcely different from the late empire in terms of the actual prevalence of slavery. Why labor the point, however? First, because slavery was widespread in the post-Roman West, and this surely was, at least partly, a Roman legacy. Second, because the early Middle Ages were not a period of serfdom, if we understand the latter historically, but rather one of servility, that is, of mixed labor forces, where slaves, former colonai, and freed people were conjointly deployed on large estates, that were still structured on late Roman lines and indeed designated by an essentially late Roman vocabulary. Thus, the meta narrative of a transition from slavery to serfdom, which Wickham himself rejects, correctly, of course, breaks down because it is too much of an abstraction. It simply merges the late Roman world into a medieval one, as Rodney Hilton did when he spoke of late ancient society creating the production relations characteristic of feudal society. But more than that, it eliminates the historical distinction between a Middle Ages dominated by a diversified servile labor force, exploited by estates which are not strictly bilateral, and one characterized by manorial estates, labor services, and a renewed assault on the peasantry. Without the Roman background of slavery, the servile relations of production of the 6th to 9th centuries would be like Athena emerging from Zeus's head. The other strand in this argument relates to the heated issue of the colonatus. A minor orthodoxy has emerged in late antique studies, which consciously seeks to downplay the element of coercion that characterized the subordination of these workers. Colonai were a category of permanent farm labor, which the government sought to tie to estates and the general interests of fiscal efficiency. They were free persons in the legal sense that they were not slaves, but restricted in their movements and subject increasingly to social downgrading and the control of their employers. For example, state owners had automatic rights of control over the progeny of female laborers, even if their husbands were free persons unconnected with estates. In the only formal definition to survive, the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century defined them as farm workers, who were permanently resident on the, estates, on the estates they worked for. The issue here is not how widespread this category of labor was in the, in the imperial territories. It existed presumably wherever large estates did, but what happened to them when the empire disintegrated in the West? On my reading of the evidence, Col and I continued to exist into the 6th century, but were increasingly absorbed into a less and less differentiated labor force that I have characterized as servile. This is why, in one of the earliest pieces of post-Roman legislation we have, the Edict of Theoderic, there are repeated references to service aut colonis, slaves or coloni, distinct but not vastly different in status. More or less the same legal provisions apply to both groups. Whereas in barbarian law codes of a later date, such as the Visigothic legislation of the 7th century, there are no references to them as a separate category, but to servi and mancipia, that is, servile classes that undoubtedly included former colonai. Indeed, it is fascinating to be able to map this crucially important extension in the meaning of the term mancipium from its strict Roman sense of chattel slave to the much looser post-Roman and early medieval meanings of an unfree 
servile laborer through the whole of the 6th century, when this evolution first begins. Burgundian legislation already supposes or subsumes tied laborers under the more general description mancipia. And in Theoderic's edict, the expression service sive colonis is used interchangeably with mancipium, showing that the latter term could now embrace both groups, slaves as well as coloni. By the later 6th century, and certainly by the 7th, it was absolutely standard to use mancipium as a generic description that included workers descended from former coloni, who might themselves still be called by this name, as, for example, in the will of Eridius, which I cited earlier, or in Degaber's donation of the estate of Etrepegne to the Abbey of St. Denis, dated 628, which has the expression cum omni integrate et solid, soliditate hoc et domibus edificis mancipis colonis inquilinis et collabus libertis servis tem ibidem oriundis quam et aliendis translatus. Indeed, one, one will of 632, that of the bishop Eligius, even contains the expression organari. Wickham disregards all of this evidence to bolster the impression that a more or less self-managing peasantry had emerged from the ruins of the Roman Empire and the, and the crisis of its aristocracy, and that words like service and mancipium described a purely formal dependence which could barely counter the economic reality that most rural la laborers were now actually tenants, who, as he says, controlled the land in their own work process. In framing, he endorses the very substantial position that most servi mancipia in our period were tenants who controlled their own holdings and could keep it its fruits after rents were paid. But the written evidence just does not support this. As I have said in the early 6th century will of Remigius, Bishop of Reims, colonists is a term for half-free or unfree rural laborers, distinct from slaves, who could be bequeathed with the land transferred between owners and even manumitted, and whose families could likewise be bequeathed. These peasants can scarcely be construed as controlling the land. Again, throughout the late 6th or the later 6th and 7th century, the Spanish church fought hard to retain control over the services of freed people who had once been their slaves. And refused to acknowledge their freedom unless it had such control. And Merovingian charters are full of references to Mancipia, who, given the nature of the typical Merovingian estate, still rooted in the Roman traditions of Gutzwirtschaft, were not a loose collection or dispersed mass of rent-paying tenancies, but at best allotment holders retained by the estate as a captive labor supply, and otherwise simply landless slaves dom domiciled in the outbuildings of their master's farm, or near the estate center. The huge wave of manumissions that transformed the landscape of medieval Europe, reassembling what would later and only gradually become a peasantry proper, threw up a vast array of intermediate categories between pure slaves and pure peasants. And it is this mass of servile labor that formed the backbone of elite agriculture down to the feudal reaction of the 11th to 13th centuries and the imposition of serfdom. Thus, on the one hand, slaves and slavery remained a substantial part of Lombard, Anglo-Saxon, and other early medieval societies, while on the other hand, large numbers of them were settled on the land with the allotments called mansi, described legally as their peculium, peculiaria, or res peculiaris, the usual vocabulary for the assets managed by a slave. The general point I wish to make is that the post-Roman early medieval world was characterized by a great deal more complexity in the structuring and composition of its rural labor force than suggested by Wickham's simplified image of tenants who controlled their own holding and could keep its fruits after rents were paid. The best generic description, as I suggested earlier, might be a mixed servile labor force, where families themselves might be of mixed legal status and where the great movement of manumission was creating reserves of labor still integrated into centralized estates rather than the independent farm complexes called hube, also known confusingly as mensai, 
when the latter term acquired its more expansive sense in the Central Middle Ages. That a more substantial or autonomous peasantry existed or was emerging is incontrovertible. The feudal reaction would be incomprehensible without it. But to understand its emergence, we have to describe the context of the relations of production within which it developed, with less abstraction and certainly less schematically than either Wickham or an earlier generation of Marxists have tended to do. The meta narrative of the transition from slavery to serfdom, which Wickham rejects, cannot be replaced by the equally abstract idea that, when the Romans abandoned the slave mode, they went straight over to rent paying tenants, or by the notion that the economic shift from the slave to the feudal mode had already taken place well before 400. It is bizarre to call the Roman Empire feudal unless one is determined to plead the category of all historical content. And slavery did not simply disappear. It would be altogether more correct to refer to its mutation as George Duby does. Wickham's simple dichotomy between legal condition and economic form, slavery persisting at the first level, tenancy widespread at the second, lacks the subtlety needed to characterize the transition, even if legal status mattered less and less, and, as Innes says, there was no real social gulf between free and unfree by the Carolingian period. Now, viewed teleologically in terms of some, some inexorable evolution towards the manor and its eventual triumph, the allotment holders of the post-Roman, early medieval countryside may seem like a transitional type, a sort of station between two terminals, one called antiquity, the other feudalism, or if you prefer, between slavery and serfdom. But this, I suggest, is absolutely the wrong way of approaching the issue. Between the Demesne slave or Servi Prebendari and the peasant families in possession of substantial tenements, <clears throat> lay a whole series of intermediate categories who are surely better defined as farm workers than as peasants. The Tagish Shelkin in Germany, the Gebers, Bordars, and Cotters in Anglo Saxon England, and so on. They were a substantial proportion of the rural popula population of Anglo Saxon England. And doubtless the same is true of most countries on the continent. If we choose to call them tenants, then worker tenants is a better description of these groups than the tenants that Wickham seems to have in mind. <clears throat> Wickham discusses their legal status as largely irrelevant on the grounds that the distinction between free and unfree was typically and increasingly fuzzy. This is true, but the diminished legal condition of most or all of these groups was surely not unrelated to the fact that, taken as a whole, they formed a tied labor force on a model familiar to late Roman landowners and their free but tied colony. Indeed, the laws and the colony were themselves a major influence on the social condition of the me medieval peasantry. Insofar as the successor kingdoms absorbed them, them selectively and enforced them against their own dependent populations. <clears throat> The Mancipia, who appear in Merovi Merovingian charters, were certainly not slaves in the strict Roman sense, but the fact that they were described in this way was not unrelated to the way large estates saw themselves using the labor of these workers. To sum up, early medieval relations of production were defined by considerable complexity, not so much in terms of legal status, which mattered less than it did in the Roman world, as economically, and the nature of the labor force, which was typically mixed, but in general characterized by the kind of servility that was distinctive of post-classical slavery and best conveyed by the term mancipium. This was a late antique legacy, but one which the post-Roman kingdoms transformed insofar as a common condition of servility now engulfed both slaves and former tied laborers. Manumissions were widespread, but freed people still subject to domination and new aristocracies were bringing land into cultivation by creating peasant tenures of a kind previously unknown. Large-scale enterprise and direct management were crucial parts of the legacy late Rome passed on to the Carolingians. Both tied labor and the direct management of, of estates were integral features of the Carolingian world and of the new energies manifested in the evolution of bilateral estates by the 8th century. Yet the continuity and traditions of direct management did not imply a continuity of estate structures.
However we construe serfdom, whether economically in terms of labor services or socially in terms of the characteristics, Mark Bloch emphasized, it was not a feature of the period between 400 and 750, or even 800. The spread of slave tenancies created a captive labor supply in the form of, surf, of reserves of labor power. As Bloch himself indicated, the land that had been granted to them, slaves, was like their salary. This was closer in nature to labor tenancies than to the more archetypal, feudal institution of labor services. Finally, as Faith writes, the freed slave was a worker who in return for selling his labor as a commodity received a wage in hand or in land from the Lord, who was his employer and sole purchaser of that labor. The Lord in his capacity as employer was essential to him. By contrast, the serf was a peasant with a holding, which, however small, supported him and his family and provided a surplus which was transferred to the Lord in rent paid in cash kind or labor, or in all of these. What this suggests is the more general distinction between labor services bound up with the expansion of the manorial regime from the 8th century and labor tenancies still rooted in late antique models of a state organization. 8.5, the East, vulnerability. In his book, The Islamic Law of Land Tax and Rent, Weber Johansson argues, in a chapter strikingly entitled The Death of the Proprietors, that the small holding peasantry of the Islamic world began to disappear from the second half of the 10th century with the evolution of the ikta system. Ikta, in this later sense, referred, of course, to the holding of revenue assignments on specified lands in, in lieu of a cash salary, and thus presupposes a more or less centralized state. The system was widely used throughout the Islamic world, including India, where it went by a variety of names, such as Mukasa, Jagir, and so on. In later centuries, Johansson argues, the trend was consolidated as large estates were formed through the privatization of these tax assignments, capital investments in the purchase of land, and the outright grant of private ownership to members of the elite. Much of the political economy of Islam might be seen as an unstable equilibrium between the fiscal supremacism of the state and the capitalist tendencies of members of the elite who, def who defended claims to private property and the rights of pious foundations, waqf rights, especially on arable lands where these were sometimes fiercely contested. In these struggles, the jurists of the Mamluk and Ottoman periods tended to support the latter. In the 15th century, the Hanafi Mufti Ibn al-Humam exclaimed in bafflement, can't you see that the land is not the property of the cultivators? This is so in spite of what we said about the lands of Egypt being Karaj lands. In other words, it no longer mattered that the peasants paid taxes. The legal fiction that the payment of taxes was proof of one's title to the land was now effectively defunct. For Ibn al-Humam, the notion of the death of the Karaj prayer or payer served to explain and legalize the tenant status of peasants and the fact that they no longer enjoyed property rights with regard to their lands in spite of their paying their levies to the mukta and the ruler. In the following 16th century, Ibn Nujaim's defense of the property rights of the landed classes against the incipient Ottoman drive to transform all land back into state property rationalized those claims by arguing that peasants too poor to pay taxes or cultivate the land would lose the disposition of their property, and that the ruler was entitled to sell such land on their behalf. But once sold, the government was no longer entitled to an extra payment for use of the land, that is, such land would count as tax exempt. In an odd piece of reasoning, Ibn Nujim then went on to argue that whether land was tax exempt or not could be ascertained from how much buyers had paid for it, since no one would pay a high price for land that attracted taxes. Tax exemption was seen as a sign of the status of the landowner as a member of the ruling class. When high prices were paid, the buyer becomes an exclusive proprietor of the land, and he is not a sharecropper or a peasant. Now what is interesting in the convoluted argument used to justify the dispossession of the peasantry is not just the conceptual landscape that lies at the back of the argument, that the rural world is divided into landowners and peasants, and that they are sharply distinct classes 
but the strong sense of the vulnerability of the peasantry itself. As Johansson notes, private landed property no longer comes into being through the confirmation of the primordial rights of the peasants by the ruler, referring here to the doctrine that the conquest had confirmed the peasantry in its ownership of the land. In southern Iraq, at any rate, and in the general sense that Karaj was a tax on private property, so that Karaj peers were proprietors in a full-bodied sense. Whatever one thinks of the notion that the conquest entailed a sort of emancipation of the peasantry, to me it seems unlikely. Johansson's book is a good starting point for the general argument I would like to propose in this part of the chapter. Namely, that we have to think of the peasantry in the Middle East in very different terms from the situation in the West. I concluded a paper published in 1999 with the claim that it is worth emphasizing that the Egyptian peasantry in particular has a strangely elusive quality. I now believe that this is true of the Middle East peasantry as a whole, even if the Egyptian material makes it easier to establish for that country. I would like to lay out three arguments for this general thesis, which are respectively about class structure, sharecropping, and the meaning of a state. Taken together, these arguments suggest that the peasantry in these parts of the world, that is everywhere from the Maghreb to Sindh, lived permanently in a twilight zone of near landlessness. Johansson's discussion of Ibn Nujam has demonstrated one form of this, and I shall now look briefly at each of the three topics just mentioned. By late antiquity, there is almost no evidence of, of a substantial stratum that might be called small and middle peasants, except in isolated regions and ecological, ecological niches where they were less vulnerable to the depredations of large landowners. In the Byzantine East, summary descriptions of the chief rural classes comprise only two groups, Hoitan, Korean, Despote, and Hoi Georgioi or Hoi Kirioi and Hoi Georgioi, or some variation on these couplets, such as Hoi Tachoria, Kek Timinoi, and Hoi Georgioi, that is, landowners on one side, peasants on the other. But from the way these terms are deployed, it is clear that the Georgioi were not mainly a landed class. It was not the ownership of land that defined their identity in the eyes of the members of the elite who drafted the laws or wrote histories. What defined them collectively was the fact of rural labor. This is why it was standard to use the term Georgios when referring to Colonae in the East, although Justinian himself took the trouble to explain that the Latin word designated a class of workers who were residents of large estates and farm workers. A one-third century estate, Georgioi were included among the groups who received monthly wages in grain, and going even further back, L. Abadi described the Demoisioi Georgioi, or peasants on former royal, that is, Ptolemaic land as the great mass of landless public peasants, adding that at this time, the first century, the word Georgios usually indicates a farmer who owned his own land. In short, the first thing agrarian historians have to do is reconstruct the meaning of words, instead of allowing words to dominate their perception of the flow of history. In the Sasanian Near East, we know next to nothing about agrarian relations, beyond the fact that much Iranian history revolved around the tensions or conflict between the ruler and powerful regional aristocracies. There is one fascinating reference in Emianus to the Sasanian upper class, wielding the power of life and death over their slaves and plebi obscuri. Bendeg was the standard Middle East or Middle Persian term for slave or servant, but how we should reverse translate the later expression in anyone's guess, or is anyone's guess. Perhaps it was Emianus's Latin equivalent of Dryosin. It referred presumably to the mass of commoners who survived through employment for the rich, and probably also to the kind of social groups from which the revolutionary priest Mazdak drew his support early in the 6th century. These are described in the much later Arabic sources by a profusion of terms, of which the most telling denote utter, dis utter destitution. Patricia Crone, in a justly famous paper, argued that Mazdak drew his support from the peasantry, 
especially in the aftermath of fiscal reforms that introduced a fixed monetary tax. But this, of course, begs the question whether such a group of peasantry existed on any substantial scale by the 6th century. What does seem clear is that if Mazdaq's supporters were rural, they were landless, but on balance, it is more likely that Mazdaq attracted the urban poor, groups who had no access to food in times of scarcity, and it seems no access to women in a family life either. At any rate, the picture of late Sasanian society is one of a deeply divided formation, where the antagonism between rich and poor was a constant source of anxiety for the ruling groups, and one of the most valuable survivals of an authentic Middle Persian text via Arabic, shows a ruler, probably Kus Kusro I, strongly advocating the attachment of the poor to their closest aristocratic neighbors to, re to reduce class antagonisms and ensure the continued submission of those stricken by poverty. The scale of destitution implied in all this fits remarkably well with the kind of agrarian picture reflected in a major work of agronom agronomy written almost certainly in Syriac in late antiquity and translated by Ibn Washia at the start of the 10th century. Here, as Gunnar Lumen points out in a review of a recent study of the massive reduction attributed to Ibn Washia and the rural masses of the Kitab al-Falaha and Nabatiya, we are dealing with free agricultural workers in Marx's in Mark's sense. The population depicted there is employed solely by the large estates. It has no share in landed property. That at the same time of the conquest of southern Iraq, the Arabs di did not in fact find a substantial smallholding peasantry, but villages ruled by Deccans, a minor gentry in estates cultivated by mainly Aramaic-speaking tenants, is suggested by a tradition reported in Abu Yusuf's Kitab al Qaraj. <clears throat> Umar B. al Khattab first wanted to distribute, distribute the lands of al Sawad amongst the Muslims in order to census. It was found that each of them would receive two or three tenants with their lands, and he decided eventually not to proceed with the division. In short, an independent peasantry was not a major feature of the core regions of the Sasanian Empire, and both here and in the Byzantine controlled East Mediterranean. Landlessness and dependence on large and medium-scale landowners was widespread. Thus, proletarianization took very different forms in the East and West, flowing from the gradual, gradual dissolution of bondage and the structured creation of reserves of labor, labor tendencies, in one case, the West, and from the widespread landlessness of the peasantry. In the other, the East, where the threat of eviction was a more powerful means of control. Staying with the East, the second remarkable feature is the kind of sharecropping that prevailed there and its sheer ubiquity. Noting the frequency of indefinite durations in the Egyptian leases of the 6th to 7th centuries, Stefan Wazinski had concluded correctly, in my view, that the Byzantine sharecropper had become a pure and simple wage laborer whom the landowner could evict at any time. No modern pepperologist has registered any serious disagreement with this view because it is so obvious that tenants at will are entirely at the mercy of their landlords. Thus, whether the Georgioi were bound to large estates as colonai or permanent farm workers, or worked as sharecroppers and tenants at will, they, they were united by their common condition of landlessness and total dependence on the employer. It is this feature of East Mediterranean sharecropping that comes to the fore in the Islamic period. Here are two passages illustrative of this discussing a category of land called the Ard al Haz, or lands that have come into the possession of the ruler and been appropriated by him. The 9th century Iraqi jurist al Kasaf writes, the Haz is something that the Sultan takes possession of. He brings the sharecroppers to it so that they may cultivate it. In this way, they become farmhands of the Sultan, whom he may oust at any time he pleases. And Abi Yusuf, in his discussion of different types of agricultural contracts, describes two in particular which are relevant to our theme. One of them is called Muzara'a and defined as an agreement, where the tenant receives a third or fourth share of the crop. The other, not called Muzara'a, is described as follows. <clears throat> 
A landowner hires a peasant to cultivate some land and bears all the expense, promising the peasant a sixth or a seventh of the crop as wages. From al Kasaf, it is clear that sharecropper, sharecropping was widespread on large estates, even though it was rejected by the jurists like Abu Hanifa and Shafi on the substantial legal grounds that the rent was non-existent and unknown at the time the contract was made. The jurists who defended its validity did so on the practical grounds that it was part of the way business was conducted in their countries. These later Hanafi models of sharecropping draw a clear distinction between labor and capital, basing the landowner's claim to a share of the crop on his need to expand his property, i.e. the seed, and the worker's claim on the contract alone. The fact that in most parts of the Islamic world, Muzara'a typically involved shares varying from one-fourth to one-seventh is, I suggest, linked, linked to an underlying conception of these contracts as a hiring of labor. Their sheer tenacity across the most diverse periods of the history of the Middle East is one indication of the, of the peculiarly fragile nature of the peasantry in this part of the world. As Alan Richards says, since the peasants often had little to supply but their labor power, it is not surprising that they usually received only one-fourth or one-fifth of the cotton harvest. In Nabulsi's Egypt, 13th century, the Marabi Un, or one-fourth croppers, ranked lower than other sorts of tenants, hence Sato's description of them as a class of agricultural laborers. Maraba Marabba was widespread in the Levant, Kamasa more common in North Africa. In his monumental study of Algeria under French occupation, Albert Nushi included the Kamais under proletarians. On the other hand, what the influx of European settlers brought from the 1840s was a different kind of proletarianization of Algerian society, an organized dispossession that disintegrated entire tribes and uprooted wider sections of the peasantry, creating a new kind of landless worker. Land confiscations affected one third of Algeria's population. Once the colons decided that impoverishment was the best means of pacification. The vulnerability I have been at pains to stress is different from the organized creation of labor markets that characterizes much 19th and early 20th century colonialism. It is better reflected in, Ar in Iran, which never knew colonialism in this sense, and where, as Anne Lampton points out in her book, the vast majority of the peasant population of Persia is not composed of peasant proprietors, who are a small minority, but of crop-sharing peasants or tenants and landless laborers. It is with the former that this chapter is concerned. They too, strictly speaking, are landless, but by virtue of a contract written or, more often, merely verbal. A certain area of land is handed over to them on a crop-sharing basis for a specified or unspecified period of time. The peasant providing the seed, drought, animals, and agricultural implements, or only one or two of these in addition to the labor, whereas the landless laborer, although he may be also paid by a share of the crop, is differentiated from the crop-sharing peasant by the fact that he provides only labor and can be dismissed at will. Since the division between the two groups described here cannot have been a rigid one, this is a lucid summary of the general argument I have made about the nature of the peasantry in the Middle East, conceived historically and in contrast to the West, where the legacies of late antiquity combined a tied labor force with the later expansion of peasant tenures. The third and final plank of my argument concerns the meaning of the word estate in much of the Near East. Like its sharply polarized agrarian structure, this too is a legacy of late antiquity that survived best in the Muslim world, but one which drew more on Armenian and Sasanian traditions of landholding than on any Byzantine or late Roman equivalents. The form of landholding I have in mind involves the ownership of villages, usually entire villages and often many more than one, and contrasts sharply with, with the Byzantine large estate that turns up in the papyri of the later 5th to 7th centuries. The latter, as I suggested at the start of this paper, grouped its workers into estate settlements that were visibly distinct from villages and never confused with them. Since these settlements were called epoikia, I have described this kind of estate as a poikian type, 
it corresponds exactly to the Esba estates that proliferated in Egypt in the 19th century as land was increasingly reprivatized and the ruling groups invested massively in cotton. The striking feature of the pepperological evidence is the singular absence of anything vaguely resembling the ownership of villages in late antique Egypt. In sharp contrast to this, Procopius refers to an Armenian collaborator persuading the emperor Justinian in the early 530s to present him with certain villages of Armenia. He became, Procopius says, the owner of these estates. When this man was assassinated by the pro sasanian faction, Justinian handed the same villages over to his nephew, Amazaspis. Now this, it seems to me, was primarily a Sasanian tradition, as Michael Moroni had argued in a paper that describes this type of land holding as village estates. Thus, Hermosdin owned a village which Uzman or Uthman later granted to Sad B. Abi Wakas as his Ikta, in its classical meaning, any concession of land. In the mid 5th century, another equally powerful Sasanian figure, Mir Narse, is described as founding four villages and laying out orchards around them. And even earlier in the 4th century, Shapur too is described as building the village of Vardana near Bukhara. Indeed, in Bukhara, where a minor Iranian aristocracy survived down to the Seminid period, the tradition is abundantly attested in Nershaki's History of Bukhara, a 10th century work, of which the only exemplar is the Persian translation made in the early 12th century. This refers to the buying and selling of villages, and in one passage, to 75 private villages on the river of Bukhara and the upper Faravez. It is this tradition, I suggest, that survived both in Iran, where, even in the late 1940s, the typical large landed proprietors were described by Lambden as owners of villages. The Amde Malikin, whose estates range from single villages to several villages, the number of which in certain exceptional cases is alleged to run into three figures. And in those Zemindari villages of the Mughal period, which, though confusingly also known as Dahat e Taluka, were the big Zemindar's private or exclusive possessions as opposed to other villages obviously the majority, over which, technically at least, their rights were essentially fiscal, and the model of ownership less full-blooded and closer to a hierarchy of shared claims. Ownership of villages also seems to have been widespread in Egypt in the 19th century, and as the term Uda suggests, evolved at least partly from Muhammad Ali's forced restoration of the Iltizam system, which he had abolished in 1814, and the tendency of the Muta Muta Ahidan, or tax farmers, more correctly, tax guarantors, to treat villages whose liabilities they assumed as their private property. Thus, Bear points out that a number of observers at the time of Muhammad Ali simply, Muhammad Ali simply stated that the system turned the Falahs into laborers working for the Uda recipient. Arden asserts that Abbas granted full ownership rights to some Muta Ahidan. Moreover, the ruling families Kiftliks also consisted of villages which the peasantry had abandoned. Some of these were enormous. For example, Sa'id at al Kazan near Alexandria covered 20,000 fadans. What the Egyptian example suggests is that a model that was predominantly Iranian Sasanian was taken over and generalized after the expansion of Islam almost certainly through the practice of granting villages to members of the ruling elite, either as pure land concessions, or later in lieu of cash salaries, and later still as tax farms. The general point about this form of land holding is that effectively it abandoned the mass of the peasantry to the arbitrary power and domination of a range of large landowners who came to be called by a wide variety of names. Typically, a state in this Near Eastern Islamic sense meant control, and often ownership of villages, and not the compact and discrete blocks of land that were inherited from late Rome and transformed into bilateral estates or manors, manors under the Carolingians. Again, this reinforces my general point that in these parts of the world, the peasantry, or a considerable part of it, always lived on the verge of dispossession, shadowed by landlessness. A final qualification, however, this model, 
of the elusive boundary between peasants and landlessness does not prelude the existence of a wealthy peasantry. On the contrary, it explains why this village elite tended to be a small, highly concentrated group, possibly in, in endogamous, 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 and even stable over generations. And secondly, it, it allows room for the evolution of estates in the more Western sense, as Egypt demonstrates with the Esbaz and Sassanian Iran, with the Dastgird.